It's one of the biggest medical scandals of the century, and yet for many media outlets, it may as well not have happened. Tonight, I'll be taking you through the WPATH files. This is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. The ideological march through the medical institutions has been rapid and unexpected. In recent years, we have seen leading paediatric specialists asserting that children who say they are in the wrong body must have their feelings immediately affirmed. We've been told that if a boy claims to be a girl or vice versa, they must be believed and fast-tracked onto a pathway to, med to medicalization. First puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones, and in some cases, irreversible surgery. This is known as the gender affirmative model. And while its advocates claim that it, has, it is evidence-based, its critics say it is pure pseudoscience and that we're permitting widespread medical experiments on this generation of children. And now, messages and recorded video conferences from an internal chat system at WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, have been leaked. WPATH is the leading authority on gender medicine in the world, with considerable influence throughout the Anglosphere and here in the UK via the NHS. These leaked materials have revealed something that many of us suspected all along, that leading medical practitioners in the field of gender paediatric health care are all too aware that many of these procedures are experimental. And most significantly, that they have been proceeding with irreversible surgery on patients who cannot possibly give informed consent, either because they're too young or that they suffer from some other some psychological disorder. The WPATH files were leaked to journalist Michael Schellenberger at the Environmental Progress Think Tank and have been presented and analysed in a comprehensive report by journalist Mia Hughes. It is called the WPATH files, Pseudoscientific Surgical and Hormonal Experiments on Children, Adolescents and Vulnerable adults. So are we dealing with the medical scandal of the century? Tonight, I'm going to be talking to a range of experts to take a deep dive into the WPATH files and explore precisely what they reveal about the ideological capture of the medical profession. Now, I should say that some of the subjects discussed in tonight's show will be very disturbing and viewer discretion is advised. So let's begin. We're going to talk to the two journalists most responsible for bringing the leaks to our attention, Michael Schellenberger and Mia Hughes. And Michael, I want to start with you. How did these leaks come about? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having us, Andrew. Really appreciate your coverage of this. So a source or sources provided me with these internal files. As you mentioned, there's a video and then there's also a number of written messages from a internal messaging board. And what they show is quite shocking. It's discussions of doing pot you know, potential surgeries and drugs for children, including um, ages 10, 13, uh, developmental delayed uh, people with uh, diagnosed as schizophrenic, developmental disorders, uh, identity disorders. We also see the people within WPATH, meaning the people inside what's called gender affirming medicine, explicitly recognizing that neither the children nor the parents understand the consequences of these procedures, which include lifelong sterilization and loss of sexual function. So this is extremely serious. This is up there with uh, past medical scandals and without question in my view, um, I think uh, the response to this that we've seen across the board has been real shock and horror and that it is going to result in some kind of a reaction from governments. Now, Mia, I want to bring you in here. It's an extremely long report that you've written, but perhaps you might want to tell us about some of the key findings. I would say I'll give you some individual cases, but some of the key findings, um, the main finding for me was that you can see from these conversations that this is not a medical group. This is not a scientific group. This is a group that is engaged in political activism. So somebody will show up in the forum and they will, they'll have a really difficult case and they're really concerned. Let's say it's the 13 year old developmental delayed child who is on puberty blockers and they don't know whether this child will ever reach the stage that they can consent to cross sex hormones. And then along comes a call of people encouraging medicalization, encouraging the hormones, dismissing the caution, dismissing the doubts, 
We've got cases of teenagers with liver tumors, um, vaginal atrophy, uterine atrophy from the testosterone. We've got males experiencing erections that feel like broken glass. We've got very seriously mentally unwell people being discussed. And again, there's no caution. They always encourage the hormones and the surgeries. OK, well, let's have a quick look at some of the leaked video recordings. So this one is about whether children can consent to treatment. Um, I think the thing you have to remember about kids is that we're often explaining these sorts of things to people who haven't even had biology in high school yet. And and um, uh, and I know I've, I've heard others in, in this kind of a in this kind of a setting say, well, we think adults are like really slick biologically. But in fact, lots of people have very little medical understanding of stuff like that we just medical professionals and mental health professionals take for granted. But I don't know still what to do for the 14 year olds. Uh, the parents have it on their minds, but the 14 year old, you just, it's like talking with diabetic complications with a 14 year old, they don't care. They're not gonna die. They're, they're gonna live forever, right? So I think, I think when we're doing informed consent, I know that that's still a big lacuna. Okay, he mentioned informed consent there. So let's, let's consider what the parents might have to say. Let's have a look at this clip. I try to kind of do whatever I can to help them understand best they, best I can. But what really disturbs me is when the parents can't tell me what they need to know about a medical intervention that apparently they signed off for. So, Michael, I want to ask you about that one clinician there saying that, uh, you know, a lot of these kids, they haven't even got biology at high school level. So how so. So the clinicians are aware, as you say, uh, that, that they can't get informed consent in this situation. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's very clear from those clips that you showed and also from the larger video. It's, I believe it's an almost an hour and a half long Zoom uh, video and we released it in its entirety. They know that they're not getting informed consent. So they are acknowledging that they themselves and their colleagues are in direct violation of standard medical ethics. Uh, ethic of informed consent is right up there with do no harm. And I would just point out, it's also just such an interesting look into the power of ideology that at no point in that conversation did they say, yeah, there's this lacuna. We can't figure out how to solve this problem. The fact that 14 year olds don't understand what they're getting into with lifelong sterility and potential loss of sexual function. At no point do they then say, you know, we probably really shouldn't be doing these procedures on anybody under the age of 18 or maybe 21 because the brain, as we know, is still growing after you're 18, you're still developing your forebrain. I think of how I was when I was 19 and 20. So, I mean, I just think it's it's such a shocking case. I, I think there's been a rush by some people online to sort of call these people evil and to use all sorts of names. I mean, what you're struck by is that they're so obsessed with this idea that gender is this sort of you know, real thing and that it really has to be affirmed and that there's no other way to do it. I mean, it's as simple as basically saying that Gender medicine is their only hammer, and that makes them see everything that comes to them as a nail to be hammered. And that includes things like, you know, various, you know, eating disorders, anxiety disorders, things that are clearly yes. there's other things going on that's quite obvious, and they're just mistreating them. So, Mia, just finally, I want to ask you about a recent piece of investigative journalism in Quebec that showed just how dangerous WPATH's affirmative approach to gender medicine can be. Um, could you tell us, you'll, you, you know about this, you've written about this, the 14-year-old girl who was given hormones after a 17-minute appointment. That's right. I, I got that wrong, actually. It turns out that she was given um, hormones after just nine minutes. So this is... It was a CBC, the French version of the CBC. They sent an actress in posing as a 14 year old girl. She said that she had come across the idea of trends online and that she had an eating disorder. Um, and within nine minutes, this, this clinician had give, approved her for testosterone. Her parents weren't there. She didn't have parental consent. 
And when the journalist asked them uh, about why they had done that, they said, I was just following W path. And in the WPATH standards of care, they pointed out you need to do a comprehensive psychosocial assessment. And the clinician said, well, I did. It's not duration. It's, it's the quality of the assessment. So in the wrong hands, such as this clinician, WPATH standards of care and this affirmative model can mean that you end up with a 14-year-old girl getting testosterone after nine minutes. Well, uh there's a lot to think about there. Michael Schellenberger and Mia Hughes, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like to emphasize that the leaked recordings and messages represent the views and remarks of certain members of WPATH, but they are not speaking in the capacity as spokespeople for the organization as a whole. And in addition, it is likely that WPATH itself would dispute the interpretation of these leaked conversations that have been made by the author of the WPATH files. Uh, and the associates. Now, uh, we have, of course, reached out to WPATH and invited them to appear on this show, but they have declined. So, uh, we'll move on. Next on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be talking to Helen Joyce, Director of Advocacy at Sex Matters, about the influence of WPATH both across the globe and here in the UK. Don't go anywhere. to this special edition of Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Today we're talking about WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and the leaked files that raise concerns about their procedures. Now, some of the WPATH files pertain to very young people. So here's an example of a leaked message discussing, discussing a 14-year-old trans female who started transition when she was four. And this is a message in which the medical practitioner is saying, it is very difficult to ask that they wait until age 16. Let's have a look at that. And we'll move on to another message now describing a 16-year-old patient found to have two liver masses. The likely offending agents were the hormones. And this leaked document, which admits that after 8 to 10 years of developed hepatocarcinoma, they died a couple of months after. Now, this is suggesting that medical staff are aware that these drugs are linked to cancer, even in children as young as 16 years old. And there's also clear cases where patients with serious mental illnesses are allowed to nonetheless consent to this life trait changing treatment. So here's a doctor saying, I was surprised to find that several of my clients met criteria for dissociative disorders. And this one makes the astonishing claim, someone can have schizophrenia and be ready for surgery. So to explain more, I'm delighted to be joined by Director of Advocacy at Sex Matters, Helen Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> so Helen, WPATH produced a document called the Standards of Care. What are these standards of care? So each area of medicine, uh, because medicine is so specialised now, tends to have documents that are called standards of care that set out what the evidence base is, what best practice, is, what best practice is, what the choices are. Say you're doing hip replacements, what way you do hip replacements, and there is no organisation apart from WPATH that produces anything like this in gender medicine. But the trouble is, as we heard from Mia and Michael, WPATH is not actually a medical association. Mm. I could join today if I wanted to just pay two hundred dollars and sign up and join, and in fact, many of the people who are members are not even gender clinicians. They're activists. So we have gender clinicians, doctors going along, asking for advice, saying, I'm worried. Yep. My patient may have schizophrenia, may have a mental illness, uh, may not be ready to give consent. And they're getting advice from people without medical qualifications. That's right. Absolutely. I looked through the entire leaked files. Michael and Mia shared them with me before the release. And I looked up what every person, who every person was. And some of those people were trans people themselves. And imagine that you're asking a question about a young person who has deeply unpleasant um, uh, symptoms. You know, we heard from Mia, uh, you know, gross pain in the genitals. And then yes. a trans person comes in and says, this is how I dealt with it. You can't say, well, that doesn't sound like a good way to deal with it, does it? Of course. It's all just mixed up. But they produce this thing called standards of care. Yes. Which sounds like it's got all the authority behind it that in every other area of medicine you have. But it's not. Now, some of the, uh, the new chapters in the, the, the latest version of the standards of care, which is version 8, they're quite surprising, aren't they? Yes. So standards of care 8 came out last year in draft form. It's almost a decade or roughly a decade since the previous standards of care. And the previous ones were already d disturbing enough. They marked a shift away from an attempt to provide an evidence-based clinical approach to being much more consumer-driven, what yes. the patient wanted. 
But Standards of Care 8 was extraordinary. It has an entire chapter on eunuch gender identity that claims that little boys, baby boys, can be born with the gender identity of a eunuch, a castrated person. And it says that there have been eunuch identified people for 4,000 years. What actually there have been is uh, people like Chinese emperors and Italian opera managers who have you know, perpetrated a grotesque human rights abuse on little boys. Uh, so that's a ridiculous claim. There's a chapter on non-binary people, which describes operations where you keep your own genitals and add fake genitals of the other sex, or remove all your genitals entirely and call yourself null. Uh, there's, there was a chapter in the draft about ethics, but that was removed. Entirely. Yes, so, so they've removed the element about ethics. They also removed a chapter about age limits. So they? it wasn't a full chapter, but they listed some age limits that were just recommendations. WPATH doesn't have formal authority anywhere. It just has moral authority, borrowed moral authority. Um, and they were very low and just suggested anyway. So yes. it was things like 14 years for cross-sex hormones, 15 years for mastectomy. And they took them out because American doctors said that they wouldn't be able to get reimbursed by insurance companies if there were age limits and they went below them. So they were saying they were all already being too cautious with these ridiculously low age limits. Now, I should say that the standards of care are freely available to anyone. They can download them online. But people listening to this will say, OK, some of the stuff that you're describing, Helen, is too uh, far Actually, out there, yeah. right? It can't be real. And it certainly couldn't affect anyone in the UK. The NHS wouldn't be listening to this kind of thing, would they? You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? I have to say, I think that the name World Professional Association has per 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 perpetrated an extraordinary sort of hoax on everybody. I mean, this is an activist-led document. Each chapter of the Standards of Care was developed by a committee, and on those committee are people who have no medical information whatsoever. They're just activists. Um, so, yes, the NHS, I'm sorry to say, has incorporated up to Standards of Care 7 in all the most important documents to do with gender care within the NHS. And even Standards of Care 8, this absolutely bizarre, barking mad, I would say, document with, which says things about eunuchs, that is referred to by some NHS trusts as international best practice. That's the expression that's always used. So whenever you hear international best practice cited by people within the NHS and in private gender clinics, what they mean is WPATH, and that's what they use as their authority for this non-evidence-based approach to gender medicine. Now, your group, Sex Matters, have published um, a document called WPATH in the NHS, which has all these links and various things. But there are other websites, like the General Medical Council, uh, right. the Royal College of Psychiatrists, yes. who are, even today, linking directly to WPATH. Yes, and British Medical Association as well. All three of those do. And I think it is the, um, the General Medical Council that links directly through to Standards of Care 8, so not even the more cautious one. The Scottish Government intended to adopt standards of care eight in the Sandyford Clinic. And when activists went to it, like sex-based rights activists went to it and said, look, they're talking about eunuchs. They're talking about non-binary surgeries. They ignored that until the press picked it up. And then they reluctantly rode back and just settled on standards of care seven. But finally, Helen, I mean, the NHS are saying they're trying to distance themselves now, aren't they? With all of these revelations, I mean, how could they do otherwise? You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? And I do think we're starting to see them pull back. The trouble is these things are written into their standards of care and into their contracts, their own uh, contracts for services. So they need to kind of de-radicalise, go through and specifically take it out. And they need to listen to Dr Hilary Cass and and yes. what she says. Well, let me ask you about this, Helen. Now, the, the following clip is from a training session from Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust uh, featuring Dr. Christine Minar, uh, an NHS ge general practitioner. Now, in this clip, uh, Dr. Minar is discussing a hypothetical example of a young girl who wants to transition and answering the question, how many menopauses might this individual have? The timeline for them would be they start periods aged 9 to 11. Um, it's, it's variable, obviously. The, the um, age of menarche, the onset of, of menstruation, has dropped over the years, and the average now is around nine years old. At some point, if you identify as trans and you're able to access, um, you, may, you may, you know, if we ever have um, child and adolescent services that actually worked, you may actually have um, a effectively a menopause to stop the periods when you start on GnRH analogues as part of the um, evidence-based way of managing um, younger trans people. Helen, that's an official NHS video. What do you think about that? About that? I think the same as when I looked at the um, WPATH files on the video that Michael and Mia released, which is it's the phrase banality of evil. 
I mean, this was a man who's talking, a man in his 50s, talking about what I'm going through as a woman in my 50s now, which is menopause, and talking about, about it being appropriate, the right thing to do, something that if the NHS is working properly, it would do, to bring that into being in a nine-year-old girl, a child, a little primary-aged child, before that child even has the chance to experience puberty, let alone to know what it might be to fall in love, to want a child, to experience sexual pleasure. And this is being talked about in this, in this bureaucratic language of monarchy, you know. I don't know how these people have so lost sight of what morals and ethics in healthcare are and what an evidence base might be, but it really needs to stop. Yeah, absolutely. OK, Helen Joyce, thank you so much for joining me. We're going to see you a bit later on as well. Thank you. Now, Now, I should say that I did contact uh, Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust to verify the authenticity of the clip. They replied explaining it was authentic, but they could not grant permission for us to show it. I explained that we felt it was important to show anyway, uh, because it is in the public interest. It's, it had already been leaked, and therefore it's in the public domain, and we are using it within the fair dealing exception to the Copyright Act. And while we don't know why they didn't want us to show this clip, it does illustrate some of the difficulties that we face in shining a light uh, on these problems. Uh, I'd like to emphasise we've also been in touch with Dr Christine Minar, who wasn't available for interview today. And I'm grateful for Dr Minar to get, for getting back to us, and I hope we can have a discussion on the, f on the show in the future. But next up on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be hearing the other side of this argument from Robin Moira White, a barrister who supports gender affirmative care. Please do not go anywhere. To Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. This is our special on the WPATH files. Now, in preparation for this show, we have been attempting to secure interviews with medical professionals who support gender-affirming care. We approached 33 different members of WPATH and invited them all to appear. All 33 either declined or did not get back to us at all. However, I am delighted to say that barrister Robin Moira White, who does support gender-affirmative care, has agreed to talk to me, and Robin joins me now. I do really appreciate you being here because it has been very difficult to get people to support gender affirming care. I think it's very important that all sides of this debate mm. are heard. Um, and I know you can't speculate about what's going on in other people's minds, but why do you think it might be that so many medical professionals won't talk to me? Well, your previous guest, Helen Joyce, described trans people as a terrible problem in a sane world. I think I've probably got that quote a word or two wrong. And I think there is a feeling I've seen your guest list for this evening. I am the only person who's going to be speaking in this direction. That's uh, right, that's right. And Robin, but I, in terms of the invitations, there were more people invited from your side of the debate than from the other. It just so happens that you have accepted it. I will, by the way, put that to Helen when I see her again later on. And to be fair, I wavered in coming on because yeah. I'd seen the way this evening was advertised. And uh, I am concerned that the debate about trans people is toxic and difficult for trans people to engage in. Well, let's talk about it then from your perspective. Let's hear your view. Um, you yourself have experienced gender affirmative care uh, and, and, so there you are, you, and you've had a very good experience. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I um, struggled with my gender since I, I, I was very young. I perhaps would have transitioned in my 20s, but I suffered horrible workplace discrimination that ended a career that I loved and I had to go and find another one, which was law and got to my early 40s and decided that either I had to transition or frankly jump off a cliff and went through WPATH um, moderated treatment, mm -hmm. so with appropriate um, psychological investigations, appropriate counselling before there was any hint of prescription uh, or any hint of surgery later and I've been right through Everything I've had done, I've been properly informed about, I've consented to properly. And there's an example in the other direction. I, I'm an oral advocate. One of the types of surgery that's possible is surgery to vocal cords. And I went through, I, I thought seriously about that, but because I'm an oral advocate, it, it risks me ending up sounding like Minnie Mouse and a bit ridiculous. And obviously, if I, if I was like that in court for a day, you wouldn't be listening to what I was yeah. saying. You'd be listening to that. And I took an informed choice not to have that surgery. And you have some reservations, don't you, about the, the content of the WPATH files? Well, firstly, the, the video are people having a discussion 
they're, they're not, it, it, as I understand it, it's in no sense an official position from WPATH. Yes, that's a point I made earlier. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and I have some significant problems with the report that's been written. There's a, an American trans journalist called Erin Reid who's looked at the report and has hundreds of criticisms of the report. And, and I suspect you ought to make some, att some attempt to have her um, yes, here to er discuss er that. Erin was invited to, to appear today. Well, indeed. Uh, so let's take, and I, I gave you one example in, a, in, adv in advance of speaking. So the report talks about the level of detransitioners, and I know you're going to be talking to a detransitioner later. The studies show that detransitioning is down at single percents. That's what the studies of detransitioners show. That's very low in terms of regret rates for surgery. A uh, comparison would be hip or knee surgery often has regret rates of between 20 and 30 percent because people end up with... And, and what the report says, the report looks at a study and the study, the people who wrote the study themselves question, they, they go, oh, this low single percent looks very low. The report quotes that, but what it doesn't do is quote four lines later when the investigators have looked at the reasons why that is low and say there's no reason to doubt the figures. But isn't it the case that we don't really have the data on detransitioners insofar as that a lot of them are those who are no longer in the doctor's books and a lot of this data is, cult is drawn uh, from the people who are still patients of those doctors? No, there, there are some very recent, very well worked through studies and Every study comes out with very low numbers. Can I ask you, um, with your support of gender-affirming care, I've looked through the WPATH um, uh, standards of care, and it's very clear uh, that a lot of it is driven by a, a notion of gender identity. Um, can you explain to me what, what is gender identity? Well, I guess I'm old in that sense, and, and we've moved to uh, 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 gender incongruence is the, the phrase that people prefer these days. Yes. Um, in a sense, in, in my view, when I was being treated, the standard was gender dysphoria. And dysphoria is a word that basically means dis un discomfort. Yes. And from the age of seven or eight, I was immensely uncomfortable with having to present to the world as male. So it's a, it's a feeling, though, based on, you say, presenting to the world as male. Mm. Is it based on stereotypes of gender, dressing a certain way, acting a certain way, being tough or rough and tumble or no. being femme, what, what, no. what is it? No, not at all. Um, th there's a, an essence of male or female. An essence. If, if, if you meet me in the West Country, you, you'll most likely find me in jeans gardening. So uh, it's not it's, about uh, the way you look? No, it's not about a particular thing, but there are... Uh, there is maleness and femaleness. I mean, I'm serious about this, Robin, because it's something I really want to understand. I looked yeah. at the, the WPATH definition of gender identity in the glossary. It says it refers to a person's deeply felt, internal, yeah. intrinsic sense of their own gender. That sounds very much like a circular definition to me, and I can't work out what they mean well, by it's, that. it's a bit like colour to a blind man, because if uh, and you, fortunately, are one of those people whose sense of yourself matches the... Uh, the gender or the sex in which you were born. And, I, and I don't I'm have a gender for identity. I, I, I am just male. Well, for you, those things match. For me, they didn't match. And for trans people, they don't match. So, uh, but are you not concerned, Robin, about... I mean, you, you had a very good experience, and I completely respect yeah. that and, and uh, accept that. But there are an awful lot of people who haven't had a very good experience, and there's a lot of whistleblowers coming out saying, you know, from the Tavistock and places yeah. like that, people who are working within the system, yes. saying it has to change. So shouldn't we at least be having a conversation about whether gender-affirming care is the right way to go? Absolutely, a conversation is fine, but we have to... Uh, I, I'm a scientist who became a lawyer, so I love evidence, all right? Evidence is the right way forward. And back to the studies we were talking about, and they consistently come out with very, very low levels of regret. And you're absolutely right. We should continue to follow people through the process. We should see how that works. And for those people who end up in a position of regret, that's awful for them. But what you don't do in the hip replacement example is because 20% of people come out of a hip replacement with a bad experience, you don't say the other 80% shouldn't have the hip replacement. 
OK, well, uh, Robin, I would love to be able to talk to you about this much more. We are running out of time. Um, just very finally, this idea of evidence-based, I think we all agree that scientific procedures should be evidence-based. But if that is based on what you describe as an essence of maleness or an essence of femaleness, it sounds like a soul. It sounds something metaphysical to me. How is that compatible with a, uh, a medical uh, procedure? Well, almost all psychological positions depend on interviewing somebody, finding out how they feel about themselves, how they interact with the world around them. We, we don't yet have some form of, of laser that can look into your brain and say, you know, is this how it is? We, we have to listen to people and understand how they are and who they say they are. Robin Moira White, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. And next on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be speaking to Genevieve Gluck from Redux to discuss her research into WPATH and even more revelations. Please don't go anywhere. this special Free Speech Nation when we're looking into the WPATH files, leaked internal messages from uh, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Now, the current version of WPATH Standards of Care is version 8, readily available online. There is a new chapter on eunuchs in which a eunuch is proffered as a legitimate gender identity that requires surgical realisation. This is how WPATH defines eunuch in the current guidelines. Eunuch individuals are those assigned male at birth and wish to eliminate masculine physical features features, masculine genitals or genital functioning. And this is what WPATH concludes in its statements of recommendations. We recommend healthcare professionals and other users of the standards of care eighth guidelines should apply the recommendations in ways that meet the needs of eunuch individuals. Now, in 2022, The Telegraph reported that NHS Scotland had uploaded a draft version of WPATH standards of care that contained this chapter on eunuchs to the official NHS website. But there's a further sinister element to this story that was uncovered by Genevieve Gluck for the Redux website. And I spoke to Genevieve earlier today, and this is how that discussion went. Genevieve Gluck, thank you very much for joining me on Free Speech Nation. Thank you for having me. In the summer of 2022, NHS Sc Scotland uploaded to their official website the WPATH Standards of Care version 8, or at least a draft version of those standards of care, in which there was a new chapter about eunuch identities, and specifically there was a link to a fetish site uh, relating to the notion of the castration of minors, and which also featured graphic depictions, written depictions of the sexual abuse of minors. You were the first to break this story at Redux magazine. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the Eunuch Archive was the website that was named in the draft Standards of Care 8 document under a chapter called Eunuch Gender Identity. And that website has on its, uh, on its main site a link to a fiction archive where there are thousands of stories written about graphic castration, explicit sexual castration, even of children, uh, a total of about 10,000 stories altogether. And of that total, nearly 40% or nearly 4,000 of those stories are tagged specifically with the term minor, meaning that they deal with themes of children. Some of these stories included themes of doctors halting the puberty of children to then sexually abuse them. Some of the stories involved uh, forcible surgical castration of children, primarily boys. Uh, in fact, these stories were some of the most popular on the website. And others include depictions of chemical castration, uh, there being an overlap with the drugs that are given to children that are called puberty blockers. This website was started in 1998, but had previously been hosted on a body modification fetish website called BME. So it has been running for several decades now, and men who are anonymized are allowed to produce these stories that are shared on that website. So Genevieve, uh, I, I'm sure that if we had a representative of WPATH here, uh, and we've tried our best to get one, um, they would say, but we did not link to those kinds of stories that you are describing, that, that that's a, a separate website uh, that you would have to go through the Eunuch Archive to get to. What would you, how would you respond to that? 
Within the draft SOC 8 document, it specifically names the fiction archive and refers to it, so they are aware of its existence. But in addition, certain academics involved with WPATH had been involved in this forum directly for decades. As well, WPATH has published research that was gathered from the opinions of these anonymous participants within this forum. Again, writing stories that, that involve sexual abuse of children, getting their opinions uh, through research, uh, starting as early as 2009. Uh, one such paper was presented at a WPATH conference in Oslo, Norway. And then in 2010, the following year, the International Journal of Transgenderism, which is published by WPATH, then released that presentation in their publication. I suppose the, the defense might be um, that these are private fantasies engaged in by adults. They're not actually breaking the law. They're just engaging in fantastical writing. Um, what would you say to that? I would say that within the forum, I have seen claims that were made that the research that was being gathered from this community was influential in editing diagnostic literature, specifically the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual for Mental Disorders. Now, the claims within this forum are that these men, because they are primarily men, were outsourced for their opinions on medical terminology. So we initially in the DSM-4, the previous edition, we had the term gender identity disorder. This was changed in the DSM-5 to gender dysphoria, and then there's a section added about gender dysphoria in children. Now, if these claims are true, I would think that would be quite damning that anonymous participants of a fetish forum had a hand in changing medical terminology specifically in regards to the medical transitioning of children. So just to be absolutely clear, it is your contention that there are senior academics and clinicians who have a vested interest in the castration of children insofar as that they have a fetish relating to that subject and that they are directly involved with the modification of policy at WPATH. Yes, that appears to be the case, and I believe that I've seen substantial evidence that that is the case. As well, within that forum, videos were being uploaded as pornographic content that involved castration and even what are euphemistically called MTF surgeries or the transsexual surgeries. So this is very disturbing stuff. Um, but I suppose WPATH might say, well, there might be some uh, members who have these uh, fetishes. Um, but a lot of the people, a lot of the practitioners who are engaged in the, the transitional uh, procedures with minors uh, are not motivated uh, by that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I do think there are a lot of different motivations going on behind the scenes for various individuals. However, it's been my observation that within the medical protocols and sort of the leading figures pushing the transitioning of children, there is a strong overlap between paraphilias and fetishism from the research that I have done. Now, you've been at the forefront of it, uh, exposing a lot of these stories over the past few years at uh, Redux magazine. Can I ask, um, when you exposed this, this particular point that NHS Scotland itself had uploaded uh, this draft version of the standards of care, which linked to this fetish site, they did, I must emphasize that NHS Scotland did apologize for that and subsequently distanced themselves from WPATH, although there was a leaked recording of a clinician at the Sandyford Sexual Health Clinic in Glasgow uh, suggesting that, in fact, WPATH did still uh, influence NHS uh, policy. So why is it that given the severity of these revelations, your story wasn't picked up more widely? It was only as far as I can see uh, the Telegraph and the Mail that reported on, on NHS Scotland uploading uh, this draft. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. The first being that the story is so grotesque that most people might not tend to believe it or dismiss it as the realm of a conspiracy theory, regardless of the evidence that we provided in our reports. I also think that there is a tendency to hope for the best in your medical professionals. You don't want to have this view that someone that you're trusting with your health or even the health of your child might be influenced by bad actors or even have a bad intention themselves. 
So Genevieve Gluck, uh, there's a lot to explore here and I think it would be fantastic to have you back on the show uh, in some time so that we can explore this a little further. Um, thank you ever so much for joining me. Thank you so much for discussing this issue with me. Now, I should add that GB News has seen evidence of what Genevieve describes as a strong overlap between paraphilias and fetishists among some members of WPATH. But we want to be clear that this does not reflect WPATH as an organization or its policies. And you can find more information about all of this from uh, Genevieve's, Genevieve's research, and more specifically about the Eunuch archives, at redux.info. That's redux with two X's, dot info. Helen, can I get your reaction to that interview? Extraordinary journalism from Genevieve and Redux, I would say. And I would make a link back to something that Robin said earlier, which was in answer to your question about what is gender identity. Mm. So for Robin, it was male and female essences, which are souls. Some of us believe in souls and some of us don't, but there's no evidence about them. But I think Genevieve puts it much better, which is that there are many different reasons why people might seek to tra transition or why they might seek to push transition on others. The disturbing fact is that some of those motives are really very unsavoury. There are clearly adult men who fantasise about children transitioning. And, 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 you know, if I went to a doctor and said I'd like to have both my arms removed because I just want it because my essence tells me to do it, they would presumably say no. Why should it be any different with testicles? What they'd actually do is send you for a psych evaluation. And I think, you know, the question is asked and answered. Yes. I want to ask you also, Helen, about something that Robin uh, Moira White said earlier, and this was an allegation really towards you, uh, that you had said, every trans person is a huge problem in a sane world. And I want to give you a right to reply on that. That was part of a larger segment in which I said something that I think is more true every day, which is that every person who denies the reality and immutable nature of binary sex is a very big problem for the rest of us. So, right, so... It's, it's important that we clarify that, that you're not talking about people who just choose to identify a certain way and want to live their life in a certain it's way. It's the people who are trying to make the rest of us go along with their evidence-free and, in fact, false beliefs are the problem, yes. whether they identify as trans or not. I'm really glad we got to clear that up because I've seen a lot of people throw that accusation at you and it's, it's important that we... You only have to look at the context and it's clear to see. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, well, look, um, that's all we've got time for in this section. We've covered an awful lot tonight uh, and we've got an awful lot more to come later on. We're going to be speaking to Fiona Makanena. We're going to be speaking to Dr. Al as Hakim, who used to work at the Tavistock as well. We're also going to speak to uh, an individual who has been through the transitional process and has since detransitioned. I'd like to talk as well to Neil Hanvey MP, who's a Scottish uh, Alba Party MP, who has been raising some of these concerns in Parliament, but getting an awful lot of pushback as a result of that, in particular from one uh, very vocal Conservative MP in a debate last Friday in Parliament. And I'd like to consider the political ramifications of this as well. Uh, Please do not go anywhere. We've got a lot to cover in this special Free Speech Nation episode on the WPATH files. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to this special edition of Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Today we're talking about the WPATH files. WPATH is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And these leaked files raise a lot of concerns about uh, the organization's recommendations and influence. Now, as I mentioned in the previous section, we have been attempting to secure interviews with medical professionals who support gender affirmative care. We approached 33 different members of WPATH. We invited them to appear. All 33 said no or didn't get back to us at all. We also approached groups who have openly endorsed WPATH and its approach to gender affirmative care, in particular Stonewall, Mermaids, and gendered intelligence. We had no response from mermaids at all. Gendered intelligence declined. Stonewall said they would consider providing a statement and we replied with a specific request about this tweet which was posted on Stonewall's official account on the 9th of June 2023 in which Stonewall endorses uh, WPATH's standards of care. And we asked the charity if it still stood by this endorsement in the light of the WPATH files. We received no response. <laughs> and when we emailed WPATH directly, uh, we just received the standard statement from the president of the organization, Marcy Bowers. And here's that statement in full. 
WPATH is and has always been a science and evidence-based organization whose recommendations are widely endorsed by major medical organizations around the world. We are the professionals who best know the medical needs of trans and gender diverse individuals and stand opposed to individuals who misrepresent and delegitimize the diverse identities and complex needs of this population through scare tactics. The world is not flat. Gender, like genitalia, is represented by diversity. The small percentage of the population that is trans or gender diverse deserves health care and will never be a threat to the global gender binary. Now, to discuss this further, I'm delighted to be joined by the physician, Dr. Carrie Mendoza, who works with Genspect USA as director. Dr. Mendoza, welcome to the show. I'd like to um, present some arguments from the other side of this debate to you, if you don't mind, because I do think it's crucial that we hear all sides. Uh, now, we've just heard um, from um, uh, WPATH, from the president of WPATH, uh, that those who criticise them are effectively flat earthers. They believe the earth is flat, or there's an analogy there. Do you think that's fair? Uh, no, but first of all, thank you for, for having me on, and uh, it's been an honor working on, on this issue. But uh, the comment about being flat earthers really is echoing a non-science approach to a problem. And I think all of us working on this really feel that the opposite is the case, that there has been a lot of evolving data showing that the evidence for transition, especially for minors, is really quite low quality as well as increased uh, evidence of detransitioners and concerns about their care and what happened with a misdiagnosis. So I, I really don't think that that's an accurate you know, claim at all. So what you're saying is, I mean, it sounds very much like projection. It sounds like someone uh, throwing out the accusation that he's likely to be thrown their way. Is that a, a fair assessment? I, yes, I, I, I do really think so, that it is more of a projection. And I think what's happened um, in the medical discussion is really been taken over by activism rather than just a discussion of the pros and cons and the science. And in healthcare, we don't try and silence debate amongst physicians. We try and encourage it. So I don't think that comment is really helpful for you know a high-quality scientific discussion. Now, um, Professor Stephen Whittle, who's former president of WPATH, tweeted out a, um, a screenshot from a study which suggested that there was a 99.7% success rate of gender-affirming surgery. I spoke to Robin Moira White earlier, who said that there was a very uh, uh, low rate of regret uh, among those who transitioned. Now, are you aware of the study that Professor Whittle is talking about? Um, and does that not suggest that the gender-affirming approach actually is effective? Yeah, that's a great question. I did uh, look deeper into that study. It's behind a firewall. And uh, once I read through the whole study, there's really a couple very interesting points. First of all, it's just one single center. Um, they, they said that the project was exempt from IRB approval, meaning the normal approval process for um, ethical studies wasn't done. They don't say why. Also, an, a big limitation was they said that it was only the patients that came back to them that were included in the study. So we see there's a big problem. There could be a lot of patients left out, people that didn't feel comfortable coming back. Um, I also think, why would you go back to the surgeon that did your surgery if you have re regret? There's quite a, a big limitation there. So I, I think that number, that top line number, really doesn't accurately reflect um, all the information that we're seeing that patients have a lot of concerns and they don't feel comfortable going back. They feel shamed. They don't have proper outlets to get the care that they need. So, so I think it's words, misleading. So in other words, almost 100 percent of the people who did feel it was successful that came back to say so felt that it was successful. In other words, all of the people who didn't aren't included in the sample. That's exactly right. It's a small sample from one center. And yes, you, okay. you bring that. Out. So you have to go behind the firewall to see that. Yeah. OK, very interesting. So that's the uh, if you look at the uh, pinned tweet of Professor Stephen Whittle's Twitter account, that's the study that is being cited there. Now, some WPATH supporters like Erin Reid uh, of Erin in the Morning on, on X or Twitter say that the files reflect uh, typical clinician conversations and um, what is described as edge cases or just extreme cases. 
How do you respond to that? Well, I, you know, I just think that, first of all, doctors don't talk like that. Um, and, you know, Aaron is, is not a physician, um, but I can tell you as physicians, we don't, we don't talk like that. If there's a serious complication or some issue like cancer, that would be really raising alarm bells. And we would be putting out alerts like, let's figure this out. These people are, are being harmed. And we haven't seen any of that. And, you know, one person harmed or misdiagnosed is really what we call a, a, a never event. It's a safety kind of conversation in healthcare. You know, we don't accidentally give people a medicine they're allergic to or accidentally cut off the wrong, you know, limb when we're doing surgery. Those are serious safety events. And so, you know, folks that have had surgery, been misdiagnosed, receiving hormones, having uh, exposure uh, to, you know, this as a cancer, situation those aren't edge cases those are human beings that are being hurt and so that's how doctors talk we need to protect patients uh, dr mendoza regarding this concept of informed consent uh, wpath files uh, in, in the wpath files clinicians are arguing uh, that patients uh, consent to many many things in medicine even when they don't understand the intricacies uh, of those things. And, and the, the, the doctors on the WPATH files are sort of suggesting they don't need to uh, understand. The example uh, given is a diabetic taking insulin but doesn't need to understand how the pancreas functions. Um, gender medical care, is that, is that the same? Is that a fair comparison? I, I don't think that it is. So in the case, you know, with a diabetic, um, first of all, you can, there are specific diagnostic tests to say they, this person is diabetic and this is the medicine that they need and these are the doses that they need it in and they can measure the effect of the treatment. We don't have any of that in gender medicine. It's clear that they don't know who they're diagnosing for what. They have just broadened out this treatment, but the assessments to call out people who don't fit, for example, with severe mental health, issues um, or med medication adverse effects and cross reactivities, they don't talk about any of that. So they don't really have a clear diagnosis and a way to measure that and then a way to track and measure the effects of the treatment. So I, I really don't think it's a fair comparison at all. And we know from the files that they know the patients don't understand exposure to these lifelong issues, including potentially cancer. And moving forward, what, what do you think needs to be done uh, to restore ethical health care for, for gender medical care? Well, I think more conversations like like you have been hosting. And I do want to say that, you know, I applaud the barrister for coming on and talking and having that that courage to discuss all of this. I think we need much, much better tracking. You know, we're in a phase um, where this this intervention is wide cross in clinics and hospitals in the United States and elsewhere in the UK. So we really need to properly track um, the dose of medications people are getting and the long-term side effects. And, and that's just how medicine is, is practiced. That's nothing to do with advocacy. We really just want you know people to get the best health care, including folks who are trans identified. They shouldn't be subjected to medicines and procedures that aren't having the proper safety guardrails around them. Dr. Kerry Mendoza, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. And next on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Az Hakim, a consultant psychiatrist and med medical uh, psychotherapist and former Tavistock Trust doctor. And I'm also going to be speaking to Fiona McEnena, campaigner at Fair Play for Women. I'll be back in a few moments. <laughs> Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Now, for some time now, it has been assumed that the affirmative approach uh, to gender dysphoria is the only way 
to prevent patient suicides. But last July, a letter to the Wall Street Journal signed by 21 leading professionals involved in the care of gender diverse youth opposed the view that this form of treatment is optimal and pointed out that there is no secure evidence that puberty blockers reduce the risk of suicidal ideation. And last month, this was confirmed in a major study published in the British Medical Journal based on a group of Finnish adolescents who were being treated for gender dysphoria between 1996 and 2019. So to discuss this and much, much more, I'm joined by Dr. Az Hakim, consultant psychiatrist and former consultant in forensic psychotherapy at the Tavistock, and Fiona McEnana, campaigner at Fair Play for Women. Uh, and we also have Buster here with us, which is uh, Dr. Az Hakim's lovely hound. Um, Dr. Hakim, I want to ask you about this question about suicidal ideation. This has always been the claim that has been made by activists. Would you rather have a trans child or a dead child? It's almost like emotional blackmail for parents. But hasn't this been completely blown out of the water by these studies? It's, it's nasty rhetoric. It's nonsense. So there was actually more than one study in the BMJ. There's, there's repeated studies have shown that gender affirming care has little or no impact on psychiatric morbidity and the mental health of trans-identified kids. Yes. Um, in fact, studies show the opposite, that, that people who go through this have quite a, an abundance of, of mental health problems. So it's bandied around as if it's a fact, but it's one of these post-truth facts that has yes. no basis in reality. Now, as someone who, who worked for the Tavistock, um, I mean, you understand this more than most, I think, but can you just talk to us a bit about that? Because there are other uh, aspects to these patients' lives that need to be explored, need to be considered. But the Tavistock, am I right in thinking, was just going with the, the WPATH model, which is the mm. affirm gender. I believe in 2013 there was a, 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 an NHS document stating explicitly that the Tavistock was following uh, WPATH standards of care. Am I right about that? Yeah, so just, just to make it clear to, to your viewers that I, I was at the Portman, which is part of the Tavistock, and I was leading a psychotherapy-only service. So whilst I was training, I was attached to the GID service, the, the, the child gender clinic, yes. uh, and I was a voice of dissent because I thought what they were doing is nonsense. And as I frequently said, I, when I said to one of the people leading the clinic, what, isn't what you're doing mad because aren't these young boys just going to grow up to be gay men? And the answer I got was, well, would it be any more mad if they were gay? So, so the, this was a clinic which, which believed that a homosexual outcome was a bad outcome, so it's better to convert them into a trans heterosexual child than a, than a homosexual child. So that's the basis of what the clinic was, was formed on. Um, what that's, I, incredible. that's the NHS? Yeah, that was the NHS. So I mean, you're was... talking about the kind of mentality that informs the, the mullahs of Tehran, the people in Iran that say, we will fund sex change operations for gay people because otherwise we'll be hanging them by crime. It was a small specialist service then, which was left alone, and most of the Tavistock didn't want anything to do with it. They turned a blind eye, so they were allowed to do whatever See. they wanted. Then it grew like a tumour, and now... Whenever you hear the word Tavistock, everyone associates it with GIDS. But when I was there, it was actually quite small. It was just a small boil then. Yes, very interesting, because we're talking about this influence of the NHS, uh, of WPATH on the NHS. And, and Fiona, um, you've been uh, considering this notion of the software, the, the, the computer software that the NHS has been adopting in certain trusts, which I believe has come straight from WPATH. Is this right? Yeah, so in America, WPATH persuaded software companies and indeed the government to build gender identity and, and, and all of the associated requirements into the software that is used in healthcare systems. And now the NHS is adopting that same American software. So we're seeing NHS trusts rolling out patient records where if you walked in, Andrew, they wouldn't ask you whether you were a man or a woman. They'd ask you whether you were cisgender or transgender or some other identity. And then because they've obfuscated plain old male and female, which, of course, is entirely predictive of, of your health care, um, you know, the, you know, the component parts of your body, because they've kind of replaced that with gender identity, they're now asking people to go through an organ inventory. So you potentially have a situation where someone walks up to check in for their appointment in a hospital and they have to answer questions about which sex parts they've got. Which, so you're talking about organs, genitals? Yes, yes. And to declare organs. your genitals on the yes, form. Yes, indeed. So you, you or your grandmother could be asked whether you've got a penis or ovaries, or both. I mean, that is just clear evidence of ideological capture, I would have thought. And this is software called Ep Epic? It's called Epic. A number of NHS trusts have already rolled it out. They've spent getting on for half of a billion pounds already. It is, continue, it is in use as far as we know. And I have heard instances of how it's already causing confusion, both in the US and in the UK. So let me give you a couple of examples. 
Uh, and this is why this matters to all of us, because it is, it is trashing our, our NHS and it's introducing greater risk of medical error. You know, Carrie talked about medical error. That's what happens when you confuse people. So there was a published case in a respectable American journal of uh, uh, a young man who was in the emergency room with severe abdominal pain and nobody knew, and this person didn't say, he was actually a pregnant woman who'd been taking testosterone. And by the time the hospital staff understood that this person with a beard in front of them uh, actually was a, pr a woman in late pregnancy with preeclampsia, the baby had died. Uh, couldn't be saved. Now, we, we're not at that point yet in the UK, mm. but uh, someone who works um, with sick babies uh, in a hospital here in the UK told me that one of the things that's very important in records of, of uh, paediatrics is that you know the gestational age of the baby. In other words, was it premature or not? And this person told me that um, they had seen medical records for two very sick babies, 10 months old and 16 months old, for which they had not recorded the gestational age, but they did have their pronouns. So we're talking about, again, gender identity. It goes back to yes. this point about gender identity. Uh, Dr. Hakim, I, I, I'm really shocked at those stories that Fiona said. I haven't heard those before. I mean, that, that I find absolutely incredible. And this is, as I say, the NHS. Now, when a, a, a medical body becomes infected with an ideology that is effectively anti-science or pseudo-scientific, I mean, this is a disaster, isn't it? Yeah, so, but we've seen the capture of the General Medical Council, the BMA, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, all the Royal Colleges. They've all been captured. And I teach medical students from a very reputable central London medical school and they're all captured. Well, people won't believe me, but you can go to their websites, the, the organisations you, you just mentioned. Yeah. They have direct links to WPATH's version 8 standards mm -hmm. of care, yeah. which tells people that eunuch is a legitimate gender identity. This is, and they this... probably haven't even read uh, the WPATH guidelines. They probably don't, haven't even critiqued what the, what, how the guidelines form. Because you know, doctors rely on evidence-based practice guidelines, and so there's an element of trust. Yes. So if we're told that there are international guidelines by professionals, we trust that. But as, as your previous guests have said, they're not professionals. Any, anybody can join, and they're, they're mainly activists. But, it, but isn't it absolutely essential that you know whether the patient is male or female? You know, I would have think. thought that... I, I, you know, I don't mean to be flippant, but I would have thought that a medical practitioner uh, would, 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 would perfectly respect someone else's rights to their own belief system. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, when you go to the doctors, you don't tell them if you're a Catholic or a Marxist but, or anything but like that. But what you've got is a bit like 1984 George Orwell. All the doctors and medical students know what they really think, but they're going along with a charade because they think that's what they're meant to do. Yes. So when I teach the medical students, they look, and I virtually nearly shake the sense into them, they say, we didn't think you were allowed to think like that. You know, they're, they're all thinking, oh, well, two and two is five, isn't it? But they know it's four. Yes. So they, all the doctors I've spoken to, they're all grounded in common sense, but they think they're not allowed to show the common sense because they have to go along with this mantra and the ideology. Can I bring Fiona in on that point? Um, is it the case, do you think, that what Dr Hakim has just described, of people within the profession... I would imagine most people in the profession, I would imagine most doctors know the difference between a man and a woman. But not being able to say so, is that because they're intimidated? I mean, we've seen some of the behaviour of trans activists can be very frightening, mm. very intimidating. Mm. Or is it because they've actually bought into this quasi-religious belief system? I mean, you know, just like the belief itself, who knows what's in someone else's head? Mm. But what we do know is that they all feel they have to go along with this. They have to ask people, you know, about all about their organs. Could you be pregnant? Uh, you know, what's your identity? All this stuff. And so the burden that that places on healthcare staff is that they're getting caught up in a whole lot of irrelevant information that actually gets in the way of what's important. Yes. And, and, and the, the, just one final thing, that matters to all of us because that's not helpful in healthcare. But the people who should care most are the people who advocate for trans-identifying people because they're the ones whose health is at the greatest risk if their sex is not correctly recorded and identified when they present in hospital. I mean, in some of this software that you're describing, um, is it not the case, I mean, maybe I'm, this is wishful thinking, but perhaps it says biological sex and then next to it, if you have a gender identity, feel free to declare it here. Well, I think you've just solved what it should be, but that's right. not what it is, because don't forget that what WPATH lobbied for in the US, and it's now being adopted here, is that everyone has to sign up to this. So there's a very complex set of questions. There's legal sex, there's cisgender, all these identity things. Uh, so no, it's not that simple. 
Finally, uh, Dr Hakeem, I mean, but isn't it the case that the Hippocratic Oath says, first, do no harm? Mm. You know, you're, you're, you have to be doing what is right for the patient, not what is right for some kind of esoteric belief system. Um, so why is it that... I mean, I know you say that doctors aren't speaking out, and maybe it's intimidation... But also but... the doctors are being fed the, these lies of statistics which are false, like the uh, 1% regret rate. As your previous guest said, it's, it's a nonsensical study. Well, tell and... us about that, because the last guest said that very few people regret uh, the transitional surgery. Nonsense, nonsense. So when I ran my therapy service, 26% of my patients were regretters and none of them had been followed up. They were invisible data. No one had asked them. The GIDS clinic didn't follow anyone up. The adult gender clinics, to my knowledge, don't follow anyone up. Um, there isn't really a good tool to measure outcomes. So a number of years ago, my research team and I in Australia invented a tool. I've since contacted every gender clinic and said, would you like to use it for free? And they've all not replied. None of them have replied. So there's, there's, there's no way of collecting the evidence. Well, there is, but they don't use it. And they just don't collect it, which is uh, one of uh, Cass's criticisms of the service. So we should mistrust any studies that are telling us everyone Absolutely. is happy with the surgery. It's nonsense. Nonsense. OK, and you've written a book about this, D-Trans. D-Trans, yes. Yep, so that's available now. OK, fantastic. Well, Dr Hakeem and Fiona McEnany, thank you both very much for joining me. Really appreciate it. as well. Now, next on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be talking to Alba MP Neil Hanvey, who's been raising concerns about gender-affirming care in Parliament. And also, I'm going to be speaking to a young person who has detransitioned after receiving gender-affirming care. Don't go anywhere. to this special edition of Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Today we're talking about WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and the leaked files that raise concerns about their policies and global influence. Alba Party MP Neil Hanvey uh, has been raising concerns in Parliament about the risks to young gay people that come from gender-affirming care, but this has often fallen on uh, deaf ears, unfortunately. I'm going to be speaking to Neil in a moment, but before I, I get to, the, to Neil, I, I want to talk to someone who has had direct experience of such treatment. Now, Richie Heron has been kind enough to join us. Uh, he's down the line. Richie, can you hear me? Just having slight technical difficulties. We'll see if we can get him now. Hi, Richie. Are you there? Yes. Hi, Andrew. Thanks very much for having me on. And Richie, uh, I just um, want to say a big thank you to Neil for um, advocating for us in Parliament. Uh, we do take notice and we greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Neil. Absolutely, Richie. Now, t tell us about your experience. What happened with you? Um, I transitioned at the age of 26, but because of the 2012-13 interim NHS protocols, which were backed by the WPATH guidelines, um, I was able to use a privately paid assessment to start a testosterone blocker before it even been seen by the gender clinic. Um, and then I was assessed there and it was a affirmation only route, which I would like to say is being challenged uh, in a high court decision uh, on the 26th of this month um, by the case run by Anna castle and uh, the other parent and the reason for that is i'm not sure if a lot of people realize that although the ch children's services uh, may not be used in the wpath guidelines when the students they turn 16 or slash 17 they are instantly being referred to, to the adult specs uh, services which do use those guidelines which hopefully um will be challenged at the and end of this Month. That's a very important point, Richie, isn't it? Because you were a little older, you were 26. There are some people who go through yeah. this much, much younger. But of course, as the WPATH files show, this isn't just about children. It's about vulnerable adults as, as well. And you would, fall, you would have fallen into, into that category. Now, oh, yeah. a, a lot of the files seem to be quite uh, dismissive uh, of, of concerns of detransition. As there's, um, for instance, there's one um, clinician in the WPATH files that says, yes, regret, it's there. And I don't think that surprises us. So they're fully aware. Can I give another couple of examples? There's this document from the WPATH files. A clinician is saying, if an individual patient feels they made a mistake, be careful with that, not letting uh, us change the way that others, others receive care. Here you've got another doctor saying, patients need to own and take active responsibility for medical decisions, especially those that have potentially permanent effects. Richie, what do you think about that? Well, to that I would say, f 
W path. Um, I'm sorry for swearing, but well, I, I would just quickly really. apologise to anyone watching who was offended by the language. But Richie, I completely understand the strength of emotion here, so yeah. please do continue. Um, well, to be honest, the way detransitioners are treated, not only by the professional, the medical community, but the trans community, is really disgusting. We are forgotten about. We're not even counted. In fact, if I was to go back to the gender clinic. Um, which I am very reluctant to do so, um, I would be counted as another successful transition. My detransition is not counted because it would be then marked from female back to male. Absolutely astonishing stuff. Richie, thanks so much for telling us uh, what happened to you. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate to anyone at home who was offended by the language, we apologise for, for the use of that language. Uh, but obviously, Neil, um, Richie is very upset, rightly so, and it's going to come out that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I, I think, you know, there, there has to be a certain level of understanding that we're talking about um, malpra medical malpractice on a scale that I have never witnessed in my life before my backgrounds in healthcare and some of the stories that have been set out by WPATH really chill me to the core. And we're that, seeing how they're influencing the UK. That's, yeah, that's I, the dangerous thing here for us. It's, the, there's almost, it's like everything with queer theory. The standards, the principles, everything's inverted. Everything's turned upside down. Yes. And so, uh, I, and that is exactly what we're looking at here. The type of practice that's been described in the, the WPATH files uh, is absolute anathema to everything that I witnessed but, in my professional career. But Neil, I, I just get the impression that people in Parliament, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm speaking generally here. Yeah. That they're not interested. You know, I mean, we have now um, uh, various people on the on Labour in, in the Conservatives, Alicia Kearns, for instance, yeah. who had a go at you in Parliament. They're supporting a ban on what they call transconversion therapy. What they're effectively doing is, is opposing the, thero, uh, the, the psychotherapeutic approach to dealing with people's yeah. problems like Richie experienced. Yes. yes. And what they're effectively... Sorry, I'll let you speak about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're entirely correct. I mean, it, it, is, it is a transconversion therapy ban is the green light for gay conversion therapy to trans away the gay to consign young gender non-conforming young people to a lifetime of medical and surgical interventions uh, and promises uh, that can never be realized the, these are completely unrealistic uh, expectations these young people are being sold they're being lied to uh, and there's a fundamental absence of consent and uh, when I, you talk about the behaviors of certain a MPs and the like look, we've got the, the, this scandal uh, is a, has a medical component uh, with medical practice that would never be tolerated in any other field of medicine mm -hmm. uh, I'm absolutely clear about that we have uh, a, a societal challenge where our norms and culture are being uh, infiltrated by a dangerous ideology. This is not about trans people. This is uh, the insinuation of queer theory into every institution. And we have another scandal, which is the silence of the media, the lack of reporting into one of the greatest medical scandals we have ever witnessed uh, in a way that would never have happened on anything else. I mean, if you look at Older Hay, Bristol, the mesh scandal, uh, uh, and many, many other uh, medical scandals, or indeed safeguarding scandals like Baby P and Victoria Columbia. The media were all over them, but we have people like Richie and Kira uh, and many, many uh, others, um, uh, like Sinead Watson, for example, who's not necessarily a gender non conforming person, but found her route into this yes. situation in a very different way. These are detransitioners all, that you're mentioning. Th that's right. Yeah. They're all being ignored. Now, I'm surprised the by that. scandal is being ignored. I mean, I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I believe that GB News is the only news channel that has covered this at all. Yes. Many, many national newspapers have just completely left this alone. Yes. It has echoes in a way of the grooming gang scandal where there was this, uh, you know, rape and sexual assault on a mass scale. Yes. And uh, everyone, including the police, were saying just... Just don't go near it. Yes. Don't touch it. Now, that, that's what's happening here, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. 100 percent. And, uh, you know, there are no good answers uh, as to why that's happening. Now, I, I know from my experience in my political party uh, that because I put my hand up and spoke out about this in 2019, yes. I was targeted and bullied. And I know that people are very frightened 
uh, of that. And a lot of people don't really understand what's at play here. They don't understand what queer theory is about. And so there's, there's uh, misinformation, disinformation and fear seem to be the tools and well, weapons can I ask, that are keeping people silent. Well, can I ask you, because I, I notice a lot of people say that you're being bigoted, you're being transphobic, you're being hateful. This is the thing that the likes of Alicia Kearns are saying. I should also say I've invited Alicia Kearns onto this show, hopefully for next week. I really hope she can come because I'd love to have this conversation with her because I think there must be a misunderstanding. I think people like Alicia Kearns simply don't understand the issues. No. They assume it's hate, bigotry. It's yes. the opposite of that. Well, I think Alicia uh, uh, demonstrated exactly that counterpoint and that inversion of reality. Yes. She stood up, had a homophobic rant, a gay man, felt justified as a heterosexual woman to do that and didn't see the dissonance in her position. But do you not think that if she realised that if, her, if she got her way, if that policy went through, she would be green-lighting gay conversion therapy? Oh, do you think if she realised that, she wouldn't support it? I, I think if she was prepared to listen for long enough to really understand the problem, she might get there. But I fear she is, like so many others, frightened to actually listen to the argument. OK, well, Neil Hanvey, I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for joining Good us tonight. Well. I'm going to be talking to psychotherapist Stella O'Malley, who is the executive director and founder of Genspect. Please don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back to this special edition of Free Speech Nation. Today we're talking about the WPATH files. Now, WPATH has over the years been instrumental in modifying general medical practice when it comes to what it calls gender medicine. Previously, individuals were diagnosed with gender identity disorder, but this has changed to the designation of gender dysphoria. This signifies a shift from treating patients with psychiatric therapy to insisting that the best way to help those patients is medical intervention. As such, psychotherapeutic approaches are rarely explored. And doctors that do this, they risk being accused of practicing transconversion therapy. So joining me now to discuss this, I'm pleased to welcome psychotherapist Stella O'Malley, Executive Director of Genspect. Welcome. <laughs> Stella, uh, with all that we've heard tonight, there has to be a better way. Is it the case that doctors who want to explore these issues through psychotherapy, treating it as a psychiatric condition, rather than just medicalising it, that they are being accused of trying to convert people? Yeah, we've lost our way with this. You know, like the least invasive first has long been established as the best procedure for anything. So if you came in to a doctor with a headache, they don't go straight to brain surgery. They go step by step, increasing every time. Yes. And that's what we should do with, of course, with gender dysphoria, just like we do with every other distress and pain that there is. And of course, sometimes risky medical procedures are necessary, aren't they? Yeah, they are. But it's not in this context. It's a last resort, I said. It's a last resort. It's when, um, for example, cancer would be a very good one. Yes. But there, when it's life-threatening and you're in really, really serious and we have no other options, so we're going to go into this experimental realm. But we're nowhere near this with gender dysphoria. Absolutely nowhere near it. We've got a lot of information and feedback from people who have gender distress. And generally, they need to be connected. They need some help. They need some mental health. If we look oh. back at the lobotomy scandal, I mean, it's very interesting to note that a lot of people in positions of power and influence were the ones defending it. The medical establishment would say, no, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And it was other people who had to push back and say, no, you, this is absolutely wrong. Isn't that comparable to what's going on here? Very comparable. And, the, you know, the WPATH files give a brilliant report of other medical scandals that have happened. And it's quite clear that in some medical scandals, the doctors don't back down. They continue to say that their way is the better way. Doctors and psychotherapists and people who are in my profession, we can sometimes suffer from a God complex, sometimes want to be the saviour, the person who fixes it. And I think everybody who works in, in a career, they, they like to have the new solution. Yes. And so they kind of get very wedded to this idea that this is going to fix everybody. But I, I mean, I wasn't familiar with the idea, the ovaryectomy scandal of the 17th century, where women had their ovaries removed to cure their hysteria. Yeah. I mean, I, it shouldn't be comparable, but it is. Yeah. And the multiple personality scandal that happened in the 1990s, where p doctors were diagnosing 
all sorts of different personalities. And again, it was a scandal. And again, psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists, they went too far. They got too excited. They got very vain and very full of their own ideas of diagnosis. And it died out from backlash from the ordinary people coming up saying, this isn't working for me. And that's what's happening this time. But do these WPATH files sort of suggest to parents who might be going through this, who might have a child who's saying that they're, they're born in the wrong body, that actually, in a sense, with the medical establishment just instantly affirming that, that actually the parents are going to have to really fight to allow their child to go through puberty? Yeah, one of, there's two devastating aspects for that. One is that the families are being ripped apart because the child believes that they have this gender identity within them. They believe the clinicians who say, don't worry, we can medicalise you and we can put you in a new path with a new identity and a new life. And that's very alluring for a lost and lonely kid. And they're kind of pitted against their parent who are told that they're old fashioned, old hat and transphobic. So that's devastating for a family. And then secondly, these kids are being robbed of their sexual development. So their ability to go through those crushes, checking out the opposite sex or check, checking out the same sex attraction, falling in love, that feeling of looking at others and looking for a mate, it lasts your whole life and it's, it begins in your sexual awakening. And it's cognitively, everything is going on. You're starting to appreciate poetry and music and films because you're starting to appreciate love. They are being robbed of that. Because their, their sexual awakening is being actually blocked. It's barbaric. My, my understanding is that most of these feelings of gender dysphoria are resolved through puberty, so we're blocking the cure. Yeah. Most, most the vast majority of young children who have gender dysphoria, if they're allowed to go through puberty, the sexual awakening that comes brings them around to their own body and they become uh, comfortable in their own body. And very finally, Stella, uh, because we're running out of time, I'm sorry, but... Um, what do we do? What next? What, would, what approach would you like to see the medical profession take? Well, WPATH has been discredited, so the medical profession immediately need to address the fact that they've lost their way, they need to say sorry, they need to go back to basics, back to the least invasive first, and start bringing on just a gentle, cautious, therapeutic and psychological approach to psychological distress. What a lot of people have said, watchful waiting when yeah. it comes to young people, absolutely. Yeah. Salim O'Malley, thank you so much for joining me, really appreciate that. <laughs> so, what have we learned from the WPATH files? Well, we already knew that WPATH's ideas are informed by the notion of what they call gender identity. This idea that we have an innate gendered essence, as an earlier guest of mine described it, that it's possible to feel a misalignment between this soul and, and the body. Now, uh, let's just remind ourselves of WPATH's definition of gender identity. So WPATH says, gender identity refers to a person's deeply felt internal intrinsic sense of their own gender. Here's a definition from the website of Stonewall, the UK's foremost LGBT charity, a person's innate sense of their own gender, whether male, female, or something else, see non-binary, which may or may not correspond to the sex assigned at birth. Now, in both cases, we are seeing a circular definition going on there. Gender apparently refers to a person's gender. It's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> now, perhaps the NHS could provide further details on this. How does the NHS website define gender identity? It says... Gender identity is a way to describe a person's innate sense of their own gender, whether male, female or non-binary, which may not correspond to the sex registered at birth. And if you've ever doubted the influence of Stonewall on our own National Health Service, you might want to reflect on why both organisations define gender identity with virtually identical phrasing. So, if we are now routinely medicalising those whose gender identity does not align with their bodies, is it not concerning that nobody seems to be able to define what it is that they're actually treating. Why are some doctors castrating people who claim that their innate gender identity is that of a eunuch? Why are children being told that they might have been born into the wrong body when such a thing is possible? This is ideology, not science. We have seen this across the board with the infection of this ideology in all forms of institutions, civic, governmental, we've seen it in the arts, uh, we've seen it in the media, we've seen it in the judiciary, we've seen it in the police, and we've seen it in the NHS. This is a very scary state of affairs. How did we get here? How is it that the ideology of queer theory and the notion that we each have an 
gendered essence within us, how did that take hold in a society? How did it take hold in the NHS, a body that is supposed to be committed to the pursuit of truth, that is supposed to be evidence-based in its approach? It's really not clear to me how this happened, but here we are. And the WPATH files appear to expose this for what it is. And we've been it before. We've been here before with the lobotomy scandal, uh, where it was the medical elites who persisted in these deadly operations. You had journalists at the time supporting these operations. Ordinary people weren't able to do anything about it. They just had to stand by and watch their relatives being tortured and killed, and it didn't go away. Now, eventually, many of those doctors did repent. They looked back and they said, we got that wrong. Now, tragically, that was far too late for a lot of their victims, and I call them victims pointedly. At the moment, we are talking about patients of gender medicine. Should we perhaps change the phraseology? Should we be talking about the victims of this, uh, of this cult? Now, we don't always learn from history. The WPATH files suggest that we are experiencing a comparable situation today. And perhaps the key difference here is that it would seem that the medical experts involved are fully aware of the dangers. They are fully aware that these procedures are experimental and they are fully aware that in many cases, people have been subject to irreversible surgery without giving informed consent. This is one of the features that the WPATH files prove, not necessarily WPATH in of itself, but that certain members within its community know that what they are doing is problematic, but they persist in any case. And uh, that's what happens with ideology, I'm afraid. And this is, of course, particularly the case with children, with adolescents, with other vulnerable adults. And now we're in a situation where the two major political parties in the UK support a ban on trans conversion therapy. Where are we going to go after this? Who knows? Uh, but given the fact that so many have relied on WPATH standards of care, we really have to have a conversation about this. Thanks for joining me.